Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Karen Sandu. I am the partnership officer for the Surrey Safeguarding Adults Board. So uh, thank you for joining us today for our webinar session. Um, today we've got uh, Matrix and Power um, presenting instructed and non-instructed <coughs> advocacy. Um, so we've got Kelly uh, from Power and Ian from Matrix. Um, Ian's just got some microphone issues at the moment, but we're hoping to get that sorted um, as, as time goes on. Um, I'll now pass over to Kelly, who will who will begin presenting. So uh, thank you and over to you, Kelly. Do I have permission to share? You should do. Is it is it giving you the option on, on the top right? No. You can, do you want me to just pull it up from my side then and then? If you could, that would be fab. So good morning, everyone. Good afternoon now, everyone. Um, my name is Kelly Foley and I'm one of Power's advocacy managers. Um, so we're here today to speak about Surrey's instructed advocacy services. So to give you a little bit of a brief a background on power, a lot of the time people ask us what our name stands for because it's spelt quite weirdly and there's kind of like a random H plonked in the middle of our name. So power actually stands for people of Hertfordshire want equal rights. And I know I'm here today to speak about Surrey's provision, but as a charity, we felt it was very important to honour our founders and honour where we come from. So in 1996, a group of individuals with learning disabilities got together and started to speak up on behalf of one another. And when they did so, they actually felt that they were listened to more than when they spoke on behalf of themselves. So that's why we've kept the H in our name. So what we provide in Surrey. So we provide instructed care act advocacy, instructed independent mental health advocacy, instructed non-statutory discretionary advocacy. So definition, instructed advocacy is when a person is able to tell the advocate what their needs and wishes are and what support they need. They are able to ask the advocate for support and tell them what actions they would like to be taken on their behalf. A case is instructed until we're told by a professional that it is non-instructed. Care Act Advocacy. So advocates can support individuals who are eligible to understand and participate in social care processes relating to the Care Act. Independent advocacy is about giving the person as much control as possible over their life. It helps them understand information, say what they want and what they need. This statutory role is designed to facilitate the beneficiary through the assessment process and ensure they take as full participation as possible. The local authority must arrange for a care act advocate to be available to represent and support the person where the following criteria is met. So the individual would experience substantial difficulty in understanding relevant information, retaining, using or weigh, weigh, weighing that information up or communicating their views, wishes or feelings. And there is no one appropriate or available to represent and support them for the purpose of facilitating their involvement. So aim of the duty. The aim of the duty to provide advocacy is to enable people who have substantial difficulty in being involved to be supported in that involvement as fully as possible and where necessary to be represented by an advocate who speaks on their behalf. The ultimate aim is for people's wishes, feelings and needs to be at the heart of the assessment, care planning and review processes. This needs to be just as true for those who are subject of a safeguarding inquiry or safeguarding adult review, so a SAR. So unfortunately, not everyone is entitled to advocacy under the CARE Act and the two qualifying criteria are substantial difficulty in being involved in the CARE Act process and no one available and appropriate to support them through the process. So in deciding whether an individual has substantial difficulty, the local authority must have regard to any health condition, learning difficulty or disability the individual has, the degree of com complexity of the individual's circumstances, whether in relation to their needs for care and support or otherwise. We're carrying out an assessment 
whether the individual has previously refused an assessment or whether the individual is experiencing or at risk of abuse or neglect. The local authority must also make reasonable adjustments. So example is information in different formats, making sure someone has access to a translator if that's needed, putting in, uh, information in easy read, BSL signers, Makaton, etc. So who is an appropriate person? So when is it appropriate for other people to represent the person? So a lot of the time we'll get referrals made and family members or friends are, are mentioned within the referral form. So we would have a look at that with the referrer, why they've instructed independent advocacy and why they have felt at that time, why family and friends have not been appropriate to consult. So it might be that the person who's having the assessment doesn't want their mum or dad or carer supporting them. Or they just would like they would like to the person, the person who's representing them, maybe family or friends, has actually asked not to be party to the assessment. And also paid carers cannot advocate on behalf of somebody. So you should refer for a care act advocate when the person meets the qualifying criteria. The local authority can refer for an independent advocate support for the following. So a section nine needs assessment, a section 10 carers assessment, section 25, which is for preparing, preparing a support and care plan, section 27, revising a support and care plan, section 42, a safeguarding inquiry, and section 44, a safeguarding adults review. If a safeguarding inquiry needs to start urgently, then it can begin before an advocate is appointed, but one must be appointed ASAP, which is safeguard in section 68. An advocate is there to help the person decide what outcomes they want, understand the behaviours of others that are abuse slash neglect, understand their own actions which could expose them to abuse or neglect, understand what parts of the processes are completely or partially in their control, and explain what they want to avoid reoccurring. So who can be referred for ad advocacy under the CARE Act? So if the beneficiary meets the two statutory qualifying criteria, then any be beneficiary who are deemed to have capacity to instruct and can consent to advocacy involvement and are the responsibility of Surrey and residing in the county, then they can be referred to power for an advocate under the CARE Act. For a person whom cannot instruct the advocate, they can be referred to matrix for non-instructed advocacy services. So instructed independent mental health advocacy or IMHA. So patients who are subject to certain sections of the Mental Health Act 1983, either in hospital or the community, may be entitled to help from an IMHA. This service is free, independent and confidential. This service is available to patients who are detained under the Mental Health Act, which is normally in hospital, informal patients, those subject to a guardianship, subject to a community treatment order, which is a section within the community, and a conditionally discharge restricted patient. So for persons who cannot instruct the advocate, they can be referred to matrix for non-instructed services and for out of area provision for it's for residents of other counties or metropolitan areas detained in Surrey facilitated facilities under the Mental Health Act. So the hospitals that are covered are Farnham Road Hospital Guildford, New Spencer Unit St Peter's Hospital Chertsey, Signet and Signet Lodge Woking, the Meadows Horton Lane Epsom and Farmfield Hospital Hawley. Discretionary instructed advocacy, so the eligibility. The discretionary service will support persons who are adults at risk age 18 plus, as per the definition under the CARE Act, which will include persons living with long term health conditions. Who are or may be about to be assessed for social services support under the CARE Act. This service is an instructed advocacy service and therefore the person must be able to instruct the advocate with what they want and have capacity to do so and 
to provide consent to contact third parties where required. Persons whom are unable to instruct us accordingly and provide consent where required will be unable to access the service. So adults at risk. So age 18 years or over who may be in need of community care services by reason of mental or other disability, the age of or illness, and who is or may be unable to take care of him or herself, or unable to protect him or herself against significant harm or exploitation. This may include Surrey residents whom form within one or more of the following non-exclusive groups, so older person, physical disability, sensory disability, learning disability, autism or Asperger's, long-term health condition, HIV or AIDS, substance misuse, mental health or street homeless. This service will provide support to access NHS services and they are not covered by the Independent Complaints Advocacy Service, ICAS, which is provided by Surrey Independent Living Council and may include support to contact and li liaise with NHS providers, liaison with mental health services where provided or funded by the NHS and support around substance misuse programmes. This service is for people living in Surrey who are living with HIV facing a mental health crisis or at risk of relapse and are receiving substance misuse support. The liaison with health service, including general support to contact NHS providers. However, we will not provide support to attend medical meetings. Liaison with mental health services where provided by NHS. Support around substance misuse programmes and support for assessments for persons who are not eligible for advocacy under the CARE Act including safeguarding adults. So signposting. Our Help Hub will aim to provide signposting information to an appropriate service to support referrers where the referral type does not meet our eligibility criteria. So examples would fall under benefits, including ESA and PIP and income maximisation, housing, including neighbour disputes, blue badge application and appeals, complaints against the NHS, liaison with utility companies, legal issues including support to attend HM courts, support to liaise with the police and support to liaise with private health care. So safeguarding. So as we're all aware, safeguarding is everybody's business and it isn't just something that advocates do to protect our beneficiaries. Power of, because of the nature of our work, power has almost a unique role in being able to spot where those in the greatest need may be or are at risk and to be the independent voice of our beneficiaries. We support people who are going through the safeguarding process as part of our statutory duties, but we are also human beings who interact with people as we go about our daily lives. Our safeguarding duty not only applies to the beneficiaries we support, but also to our staff, and the people we interact with on a daily basis. An example of that may be if we was on a mental health unit and there was something that we observed that was concerning, we would have a duty of care to flag that and raise a safeguarding if we felt it, it met the criteria. So power defines safeguarding as a term used in the United Kingdom and Ireland to donate measures to protect the health, well-being and human rights of individuals which allow people, especially children, young people and vulnerable adults, to live free from abuse, harm and neglect. Surrey has the legal duty and responsibility for ensuring the safety of people within their area, irrespective of the setting. How are we aware of Surrey's safeguarding processes and how to raise any concerns we may have by completing a safeguarding form and emailing it to the following email address? The referral pathway. So all referrals must be for instructed advocacy only. So for Care Act advocacy, that's led by a professional referral only. For IMHA, that can be professional and self-referrals. And for the discretionary advocacy, that can be, again, professional and self-referrals. So referrals will also be accepted by advocates when visiting their secure inpatient sites and when working in the community. So our contact details are as follows. So there's a link to our website and also the phone number for our help hub.
Thanks, Kelly. Um, just checking to see if we've got Ian here with us. Uh, Ian, are you there? I think Ian's still got some technical difficulties. So, um, Sarah, do you think we should? I'm just coming on. Oh, sorry. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Sarah McDermott, the Surrey South County Adults Board Manager. Thank you for joining us. Apologies for the technical issues we're having. Um, Ian does look as if this is in attendance, but he doesn't seem to be able to speak. And are you able to put something in the chat to see if you can hear us? All right. Um, apologies, everyone. I think Ian is having some real trouble um, engaging with this webinar. So what? Um, Karen, do people have access to the Q&A or the chat? They should do. Uh, I have opened it up for discussion for all. So if anyone attendees. has if anyone has questions for Kelly about the instructed advocacy, if you want to add them in the chat um, now, please feel free to. Um, if not, what I'm proposing is that we reconvene for non-instructed advocacy because I think it's very important for agencies to be aware of Matrix and the role they play in Surrey in regards to advocacy, partly because we as a board are also aware that there are a low number of referrals for advocacy in Surrey, so we're wanting part of the borders webinar series is to raise awareness of this so if people are in agreement with us reconvening we will however put the slides up so you have access to the slides after his session but if people are in agreement with us reconvening can you just put something in the chat so i know that people are listening to me because i also know my videos off is unfortunately um Whilst the technology has moved us so far since COVID, I think we still have some some challenges with it. So if, if everyone's okay, that would be really, really um, useful. And apologies for taking your time, but I do give you some time back and we'll let everyone here know um, what um, when we can reconvene it with Ian and make sure his technology's um, working at the time. But I think there's a question in the chat from Caroline. Um, is this the same different to IMCA? Kelly, are you able to answer that? Yeah, so IMCA would fall under the non-instructed advocacy category because the person would be deemed to lack capacity at the time of referral, so they would be falling under non-instructed um, non advocacy provision. And and I think that's why it's really important because I think a lot of the advocacy is for non-instructed advocacy, and I think instructed and non-instructed is sometimes a difficult term for professionals to understand because it's not us instructing it's the individual instructing and i think it's getting your head around that so um if everyone's okay and i see um catherine's also put some information in the chat <clears throat> a question in the chat So what should we advise clients who are seeking advocacy support for a loved one who has fluctuating capacity? So I guess it would depending on what the issue is. So what the issue that the they would be re requiring advocacy provision for. So, for example, if it was maybe a change of accommodation decision or something like that, and the client was deemed to lack capacity, they wouldn't be eligible to access an IMCA service because it would appear that the daughter is actively involved. And unless the social worker had concerns and they would be consulting the daughter for any um, any decisions around maybe a change of accommodation or something like that. So it really would be dependent on what the actual support was that was needed. 
I don't manage the Surrey services. I'm one of London managers. I'm just covering, but I'm happy to have a chat outside of this platform. If um, you can take my email address down and we can have a chat to maybe try and piece it together, if that would be helpful. I can put my email address in the chat. Thanks, Kelly. So, Karen, um, I think given we haven't been able to do the full webinar, I think asking for feedback isn't really helpful at this stage. Um, just so attendees know, we will be looking at um, having advocacy in our rolling program of webinars to raise awareness across Surrey. Um, so we'll look at having what we have next year, but we will have a discussion with Ian to get him back, let you know when it's happening and invite you all to it. So thank you for your time. Kelly, if you could stay on for a moment, that would be really welcomed. Um, thank you, everyone. Sincere apologies from Karen, who's organised this, and from the board, but technology has um, been our downfall today. So hopefully you've taken something from this, but we will get you get you information about non-instructed advocacy as well. Sarah, just one second, because Ian's saying that his um, microphone's being disabled, so I'm just going to see if I can release it. He's now showing as not having it on. Hello, can you hear me? Oh, oh Ian, Ian, we can hear you. Hey! <laughs> Sorry. Hopefully not many, device. not everyone's left. And the I'm people happy I think to either. Still here. We've had a few drop out, haven't we? Sorry, I've changed web browsers and I've changed devices. And Karen, can you put on is. Ian's video? It should be. Have you got an option to turn your camera on, Ian, or? It's saying it is on. Can't see you from my end. I'm not sure if anybody else can see Ian. I'm unable to see Ian. Would be no bad thing. Right. So um, let's proceed then, Ian, with your circle um, changing colours. And we've let presenters have cameras and mics. Um, so Ian does have capacity. Thank you, though, for noting that. Um, if we move forward with non-instructed, Karen, whilst Ian's speaking, can you email everyone again and just let them know that we've reconvened it, but that we will forward them information? Um, someone's got a pop. Um, who's got the screen pop? Karen? Yeah. You've got your screen. You're not sharing the presentation. You were screwing. You were doing. Oh, sorry. So you might need to wait. That's OK. Just right. So over to you, Ian. Apologies, everyone. I had a few technical problems. Um, we use iPads almost exclusively, and for some reason it wouldn't work. And so it was a last minute, last minute scrabble. So apologies for that. Um, I did hear um, Kelly's presentation. I don't know if she's still on, uh, but thank you for that, Kelly, if you are. Um, so my name's uh, Ian Grimwood. I'm the director of uh, Matrix. Um, we have provided, uh, want to go to the next slide there? Whoever's controlling the slide, I'm not sure who's controlling it. There we go. Um, we're a not-for-profit limited company founded in 1998. Um, we always operate locally based specialist advocacy services and have been around in Surrey since 1999. Uh, originally with myself working at the uh, Abraham Cowley unit, formerly the Bournemouth Hospital. Um, so we go back way back. Uh, we work in close partnership with our statutory partners. Um, I would say we promote, promote equity of service. People often talk about equality and diversity and inclusion, but sometimes, and this is particularly relevant for what I'm talking about today, equity of service and that making sure that people who are in some way disadvantages get the same rights as everyone else is a key sort of part of advocacy and especially non-instructed advocacy. I say we promote independence and well-being uh, and we strive to empower all the people we come into contact with. So this is not just about clients, this is about with our fellow advocates. This is without, about social workers. Um, this is about consultants. This is about all the professionals we work with. Because obviously, um, especially for ourselves, Matrix, we do a lot of work around the Mental Capacity Act. That in Surrey, that's predominantly all the work we do. So obviously, we're quite specialised in our knowledge. And so we're always happy to share that 
or do I, you have got inquiries or things you want to ask? Kind of next slide. Um, so obviously you already heard mention about instructed advocacy and it's probably worth mention, obviously, it isn't really non-instructed advocacy. It tends to be what it's called, but because advocacy was born out of sort of the service user involvement movement, it is about promotion of individuals. For, as advocacy providers, we see it as instructional advocacy is obviously coming from the client themselves. So when we talk about instructional and non-instructional, what we're saying is the, the instruction or the, uh, the information we receive for, comes directly from the client for power services, or, or, which is the key part of this presentation, what do we do if the person is unable to instruct us? Uh, and that's like what we call non-instructory advocacy. And there are a number of sort of um, types of that which I'm going to outline uh, as we go forward. So um, as you see, as it already says, and now I'm not going to read out the, uh, there's nothing worse than someone reading out a PowerPoint presentation. Um, but ultimately what we're saying is, what do we do when um, a client is felt that they are unable to instruct an advocate? Maybe they, they need an advocate, maybe the law says they should have an advocate, but they've got, you know, they're in acute mental health crisis, they've got advanced dementia, maybe a learned disability, autism, a physical health problem, serious physical health problem, acquired brain injury, there might be a whole manner of reasons that mean that maybe they're unable to recognise their own sort of needs or unable to physically ask or mentally ask for support. So in this case, what we're reliant on is what we call best interest advocacy, and that is it's no longer the uh, person instructing us, it's a professional instructing us in that person's best interest. Um, so a quick recap of the Mental Capacity Act, since we're talking about what we're actually talking about, about instruction and non-instruction is actually consent or capacity. So a quick recap for you, the five principles of the MCA. Number one is always a presumption of capacity. So the person who you may think lacks capacity on a certain issue has nothing to prove. It is on you as the professional to evidence on the balance of probabilities that that person lacks the capacity to make the particular decision at the time it needs to be made or to engage in the certain process that needs to happen, such as safeguarding or social care planning, at the time it needs to happen. Um, so individuals being supported to make their own decisions. In the end, you know, the MCA is about empowering people. So the ethos is about maximizing people's capacity, not assuming, for example, they lack capacity because of a diagnosis. And obviously that's expressly forbidden in the MCA and also, and also the Equality Act. You can't infer a lack of capacity because of a, a diagnosis of dementia or learned disabilities. And more than that, even if you've identified that, you may need to make all reasonable steps to involve the person. You know, it may be that in the afternoon, uh, they suffer from dementia, they're sundowning, they're unable to instruct you, but it might be they're more lucid in the morning. So any MCA you do, any instructions you take should be done to maximize that person's involvement. And that obviously means, you know, going with what the individual circumstances are. So maybe that person with advanced dementia type illness, maybe it's about seeing, finding out when they're most lucid and trying to do the MCA or take any instructions from them at that point. Um, the other thing is we can't infer a lack of capacity because me, people make unwise decisions. You know, if I listed all the decisions I make that are unwise, it would fill up this whole presentation, but that's my right as an individual to make that. Um, any decision that you take on behalf of someone you've assessed as lacking capacity must be done in their best interests. And lastly, it must be the less restrictive option that's available, though sometimes those things can be in conflict. Can we go to the next slide, please? So again, a quick re recap about assessing capacity. Um, often it's talked about the functional test. Um, if you've seen the code of practice, um, the, the previous code of practice, it's legally wrong. Uh, many forms we saw are legally wrong because they talk about identifying an impairment in the functioning of the mind or brain. And once you've done that, then go on to the so-called functional test. That's discriminatory. It's against the Equality of the Act. You're treating people differently because of their diagnosis. So the new code of practice for the MCA, if we ever see it, if ever it's published, um, says you start with the functional test. So which is obviously, can the person understand the information given to them that's relevant to the decisional process? Can they retain that information for long enough to make a decision? They don't need to remember it tomorrow or next week or what they said a month ago. It's only about at the time. And can they weigh up those various information to come to a decision and finally can they communicate that decision only if all those four come back as no 
you then move on to the next part, which sometimes is called the diagnostic test, but that's a little bit of a misnomer because you don't need a formal diagnosis. But really what you're saying, is there an impairment or disturbance in the function in mind or brain? And more than that, is that impairment or disturbance directly impacting their ability to make this particular decision when it needs to be made? So obviously if you, any no's on the functional test followed by your yeses in your diagnostic test, and I say you've got to be very careful about that, would mean you've assessed that person to make the particular decision at the time it needs to be made. I'm sure you know all this though. So. so I've already spoke about what does this mean for advocacy? Well, certain legislation talks about, you know, you've, you've heard about the IMHA service. People have the right to an IMHA if they're a qualified patient. People have a right to a Care Act advocate if they have a substantial difficulty and no one appropriate to support them through the process. Well, obviously, if the person lacks capacity, they're not going to ask for that. They're not going to ask for that support. And so in written into the various legislations, sometimes more forcefully, sometimes not, simply because of the way this legislation is developed over the years. It may be that what we're actually saying is you as a professional may or must uh, make a referral for a non instructor advocacy. And the difference there is certain types of advocacy, which I'll talk about in just a moment. If the act says you must make a referral, it means it's written in the statute, you must do it. If you don't do it, you haven't followed the Medical Capacity Act, you're not uh, governed by the safeguards of Section 5 of the MCA, probably the decision you made is unlawful. Uh, if it says you may, what it's saying is probably written in the Code of Practice, and if you deviate from that, then you need to record why you've deviated from that. It's considered good practice to make the referral, but it isn't a legal requirement. Okay, then. so here's the first one. Now, this one is not mirrored. Uh, this is probably the first statutory form of non-instructed advocacy. And this is the one, one that people are most familiar of, which is the Independent Mental Capacity Advocacy Service, obviously created by the uh, Mental Capacity Act 2005. It's been evolved, it's changed. Some of the language is not so quite so good because we've seen the CARE Act and other piece of legislation be updated. So it doesn't necessarily fit quite as nicely as it once did. But obviously this is what we have uh, currently until the new code of practice comes into force and LPS, but that's another story. So basically, if a person has been assessed as lacking capacity to make a range of major decisions and there's no LPA, uh, lasting power of attorney or court appointed deputy or court order that covers that decision and there's no one appropriate to consult, similar to what you heard from Kelly, an unpaid capacity, so it can't be a paid carer, person proposing to make decision on their behalf must appoint an IMCA. So you must there. So I'll talk about the key decisions in a moment. Uh, the IMCA's role really is to ensure the views, wishes, beliefs of the person are taken into account as part of the best interest process. IMCA also ensures the Mental Capacity Act is followed. Uh, and they may also make suggestions or representations on behalf of the person. You know, this could be something as simple as, you know, if it's an accommodation move, they've always lived in the country, they've always preferred to live in the country. So obviously we will make the representation well, to make you aware of that um, and would obviously expect that to be taken into account. Just to be clear, IMCAs don't make the decision. They're not the decision maker, but what they can do is challenge the outcome of the decision. And the key decisions where an IMCA must be appointed are a change in accommodation, and that's for uh, a move to residential care for a period of eight weeks or more, or a change in hospitals or NHS funded care for a period of four weeks or more, um, or they're proposing withholding or withdrawing of serious medical treatment. And lastly, an application is made by a care home or a hospital for a deprivation of liberty safeguards or a doles authorization. So obviously who can refer? Clinicians, this will be clinicians. The person proposing to perform the action might be a dentist, might be a surgeon, uh, or might be a GP even. Um, or obviously the supervisory body, which is the Dole's team, or someone from social care, which is normally around a combination move. So I've spoke about the musts, and obviously they're, they're the key sort of uh, decisions where you must appoint an IMCA, and as I've already mentioned, not to do so would be unlawful. Um, there were two extension roles in the Mental Capacity Act. It's got rather confusing, one because of the language, and two because of subsequent legislation that came out. But the two extension roles were care reviews. Uh, and again, it's called care reviews, but really what it actually is, is an IMCA has been a revolt. 
six weeks to three months later, the IMCA would come back and revisit that key decision to find out how it's going on, how it's working. So as I say, it takes six weeks after the move, and then it was supposed to be annually thereafter. It says you may in the Act, so it's not a statutory duty to do that. If we were involved as an IMCA in the accommodation move, we would prompt you as social workers to obviously to do this, because you know it's a big decision to move someone out of their home, their normal environment, into another environment. You know, we can do the best will in the world, we can we can robustly explore it, we can collect their views, we can make the decision. Um, the decision can be made by you, I should say, but I suppose collectively make the decision. Um, the placement is made, and then it's a disaster. But it couldn't have been predicted, but we won't know unless we've done it. So really, it's about that safeguard was it actually in their best interests. You know, unfortunately, we don't have uh, the beauty of hindsight. Um, and the other one was safeguarding. And obviously, this was the first, and which was a key part of what we're discussing here. This was the first time that the idea of a, a sort of statutory right to an advocate during safeguarding came in. Um, so there has to be, to be qualified, there has to be a safeguarding inquiry. And this is the key thing for IMCAs. IMCAs are all about decisions, you know, where are they going to move to? Are we going to have this medical treatment? Is this dollars in their best interest? So in the case of safeguarding, the decision is a proposed or enforced protective measure. So obviously what we would be looking for as, a, as an IMCA involved in safeguarding is, what are you proposing to do? Or what have you done to protect this potentially, this adult potentially at risk? And the MCA would be evidencing their lack of capacity to consent to that. So, and the, the normal rule for IMCAs is there must be no one appropriate to consult. That's not the case for IMCAs under safeguarding. It just says that the person would benefit from the support of an IMCA. So as I said there, the appropriate to consult rule does not apply. And it doesn't actually matter if the person is the alleged victim or perpetrator. But, so this was great when this came in, but it's almost, uh, it's built into it, its own downfall. Because obviously what would generally happen in these cases, we would receive a referral for an IMCA in safeguarding. We would ask, where's your MCA? for the protective measure, and we'd be told, well, we're not at that point yet. It's just happened, we'll just investigate it. We haven't got to the point where protective measures. So there's no particular decision. The IMCA's not sure what they're collecting the information on, and you can't you can't evidence their lack of capacity around the decision. That is uh, what you're proposing or what's enforced as a protective measure. So it was good that we had this, but as I say, sort of a victim of its own, uh, of its own legislation. Uh, so it was a step in the right direction. But, you know, what you end up with is him because say, well, I can't be involved because you're not at that stage in the process. Um, and then so we with withdraw uh, and then you obviously get to a point other a protective measure. Maybe you get to that point. You ask for an IMCA again. The IMCA comes in and then then says, well, I don't understand well, how we got this far. Why haven't we done this, that and X, Y and Z? And obviously that's a that's not helpful to anyone because you would say, well, we referred for you two months ago. You couldn't be involved. So obviously it creates certain problems. And I already mentioned right at the beginning that uh, an IMCA could only be involved, there's no registered LPA or deputy. So often, obviously, we would have an issue where the safeguarding was about uh, financial abuse by their LPA. You would ask for an IMCA and we'd say, we can't be involved because there's there's already someone who's the, who's the person in charge of their finances. I was weird, oh yeah, but we've got concerns about that. And I was like, well, no, the MCA is very clear. If you've got an LPA who covers that decision, and they're willing to make that decision, we cannot be involved. So obviously big problems here uh, around safeguarding, step in the right direction, but these sort of roles now have largely been replaced by Care Act advocacy. And I'll explain how it's better, but sometimes we can fall back on the IMCA role. So you've already heard uh, from Kelly about the Care Act advocacy. Um, so there must be a eligibility for an ICA, as we tend to call it, uh, there must be a proposed assessment, support, planning, annual review of their social care or an open safeguarding. There must be no one appropriate to support. Note the change in language here. Appropriate to consult under the MCA is different to appropriate to support under the Care Act. About the person, have they ever expressed to you the importance of... Um, what, what, what they, um, sorry, I've lost my tra train of thought. Um, have they ever expressed to you the importance of what they'd like to happen? You know, what's relevant to the decision? Uh, so it's quite a low level role. Sometimes people are scared off with, with IMCA and appropriate to consult because they think they're making the decision. People should be reassured that's not the case. You as a social worker or clinician with a decision maker. 
for the CARE Act, it's appropriate to support. So this is about supporting and representing the person to be involved and their view. So you already heard Kelly mention, they might have family who are saying to you as a social worker, this is what must happen at the end of this assessment. This is what you need to do. This is what I think needs to happen. If they're expressing those sort of views, they would not be considered, considered appropriate to support the person. It's not a platform for them to espouse their views about what should happen. Their role under the CARE Act is to represent and consult the person. Um, and I've already heard, already heard anyway, they must have a substantial difficulty taking part. Um, they must be resident in Surrey. Uh, the social care responsibility must be Surrey's, that is Surrey fund them, or Surrey are leading on the safeguarding inquiry. They must agree to the support, so you can't force an advocate upon someone, and the referral must come from adult social care. And obviously the key difference here for Matrix, they must be assessed as lacking capacity around the specific process or more generally around their social care needs. So if it was around social care planning, we would accept to see MCA evidence that demonstrates their lack of capacity around their own care and support needs. If it was a safeguarding issue, it could be on a range of things. It could be you assessing the lack of capacity to instruct an advocate, you assessing the lack of capacity to understand the safeguarding, or it could be, for example, if the safeguarding was around their care and support needs, it could be you obviously providing evidence that they lack capacity around their care and support needs. Um, so, so a little bit different there. Uh, so a few notes then on safeguarding and on-strike advocacy. So here's one of the differences. So I mentioned for IMCA, doesn't matter if it's the alleged victim or perpetrator. Under the CARE Act, it's only the alleged victim of abuse entitled to their support. Um, there doesn't need to be a protective measure. Remember I said IMCAs are all about decisions. ICAs are all about support through a process. So it can begin at any stage. And this is how it's better than the MCA. Um, it does not matter if there's a registered LPA. So this is where it comes to our saving grace. I mentioned an example before, concerns about a, an LPA for property and affairs. They're not conducting, uh, you don't think they're conducting their, their role properly. Maybe there's, you might think there's financial abuse. You launch a section 42 inquiry. The role of an ICA is now not around the financial decision or decision-making where the LPA is in charge. The role now is to support the person to take part in the section 42 inquiry that is a process owned by the local authority. And this is why we can be involved now, even though there's an LPA. And I say the support can be through section 42 or for section 44 inquiries and can even include deceased clients. The ultimate form of non instructive advocacy, obviously we don't support them to be involved, but we can still make representations on that person's behalf, bring that advocacy head, uh, almost perspective, to the uh, lessons learned approach of, you know, safe gone out reviews, et cetera. So who can refer? Uh, it will be social workers or social, social care assistants. So no one else can refer. Sometimes we do have referrals, but we say, no, the local authority must be on board of this. It's your process. You must instruct us. OK, I'm going to zip over this a little bit. So obviously, you've already heard about IMA. So it's about qualifying patients under the Mental Health Act. It doesn't now matter if they have family or friends, so this appropriate to consult, appropriate support doesn't matter. And normally they must agree for an, uh, uh, for an MR. So a statutory uh, referral might come into power, but if the client says, I don't want to see them, that's that. Um, so for eligibility in non-instructed MR, very similar as to the other roles, they must be assessed as lacking capacity around some aspect of their detention. So this could be lacking capacity to consent to treatment, could be about lacking capacity to understand their rights on the Mental Health Act, their right of appeal, a whole number of issues. Um, and this is slightly different to some of the other roles in that it's quite long term. So the non-instructed IMA, because it's a key safeguard, the role lasts as long as the detention or lack of capacity lasts, so whichever is shorter. So whereas power service would be, I come in as a particular issue, I support the client, we do the piece of work, they close the case, and in fact, there's a, there's a caveat for the non-instructed advocacy, uh, the instructed advocacy service by power, which is that it must be less than three months, generally. For us, we stay on board. It's a key safeguard. Um, so who can refer for non-instructed IMHA? This could be the nearest relative, an AMP, a ward manager, uh, the nurse, responsible clinician, a whole number of people. Um, and the code of practice states a referral must be made by professionals for qualifying patients in that capacity. And so again, we'll go wherever that person is um, in Surrey. 
if we receive that referral, uh, it has a dedicated form. It's probably worth just saying that obviously remember all advocacy is, is a safeguard for individual. It is a key safeguard of the Mental Health Act. So the last uh, sort of safeguard we have is called the Paid Relevant Persons Representative. Bit of a mouthful. It's probably worth remember those people subject to a Deprivation Liberty Safeguard Authorization are called the relevant person. The relevant person's representative obviously is appointed to them. Um, so a Deprivation of Liberty Authorization is granted if uh, a person, well, the relevant person, RP, is accommodated in a registered care home or hospital. They're referred to as the managing authority. Uh, they're receiving care and or treatment. They can't consent to the above. That is, they lack capacity to be accommodated there. Not they lack capacity around care and or treatment. That's a different issue. Uh, the only way this care and or treatment can be delivered is so restrictive of their human rights that it's a deprivation of their, uh, their liberty. Um, so in this case, the managing authority, so that's the care home hospital, is the DOLS team uh, for a standard DOLS authorization. They might grant themselves an urgent one at the same time. Basically, a whole series of six assessments take place uh, it, by the supervisory body, that is the DOLS team. Um, and if it's granted, uh, then a relevant person's representative, RPR, must be appointed once the dose is authorised. Now, it may be we are involved as an IMCA because there was no one appropriate to consult. Dole's is one of the key decisions for IMCAs. So we might have already been involved in that. So we know that it's going to come through to us. But basically, if there's no one willing, able or eligible to be the RPR, then the supervisory body, that is the Dole's team, must appoint this RPR, paid RPR, to be uh, to, to to monitor the decision, so we provide that for service in Surrey. Um, obviously, it's only for the people that Surrey are responsible for. Um, and basically, the RPR visits the persons regularly, which is usually once every six weeks. They monitor compliance with any conditions attached to the authorization. Um, so, uh, might say you know must go out regularly to their local coffee shop. You know, must have shopping trips. Must 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 attend activities. Could be any number of things. And really, the doll is there to make representations, hence they're called the relevant person's representative, on behalf of the relevant person to the care home, to the local authority, or ultimately to the court of protection. And obviously, dolls has safeguard in its title. Um, often, people always say it was hampered, deprivation of liberty, not a very sexy title. Uh, safeguards is the important thing. Um, so the only people who can refer paid RPRs is the supervisory body, the dolls team. Obviously, I've mentioned that RPRs are key around uh, the monitoring of the doles. Uh, our agreement in Surrey is if um, the doles lapses, then we say we'll remain on board as independent advocates until such time as reinstated. It's especially important if they've got no friends or family, because obviously we're an independent person. Although we're there primarily around the doles, we can ask questions about their welfare uh, or any other issues that we, we're going, we, um, we might encounter, you know, what's happening with the the wheelchair that's you know why haven't we got the salt assessment could be all number of things dentistry so we could be flagging up obviously so that's a key safeguard for especially those individuals who have no one and the other thing is in the care act it talked about for annual care reviews that if they have an rpr and so there's a dolls that you can use that person for their annual review and that's the same for us so our paid rprs would be involved expected to be involved in any annual reviews under the care act um not safeguarding because that's slightly different and obviously that would require a referral but for these instances we can do that piece of work um well there we go I've, I've rattled through this so uh how is how to refer it's probably important to remember that unless you've evidenced someone is lacking capacity they have capacity remember the presumption of capacity so if you know someone lacks capacity you are doing an mca assessment and you're pretty certain that you're going to uh, find on the balance of properties they lack capacity it, um, then it can come to us, but otherwise it goes to power because we work on the presumption of capacity. If subsequently they find the person lacks capacity, they would pass it on to us. So there's our main referral routes, uh, which have existed for some time, um, and, uh, and inquiries. So if you've got any inquiries about scenarios, we're always happy as best we can to consult. Obviously, we can't give you legal advice. You you uh, you employ lawyers and things for that. Um, but as I mentioned before, we spend a lot of time. Um, working with the MCA, it's it's our primary focus. So if we have a lot of experience in this regard, we might be able to point you in the right direction, even though we can't supply advice. And there's, there's obviously a, a free phone number there, a local number, sorry, that, that can come through to us as well. 
Um, if you do make an inquiry, please be patient. I had quite a few inquiries yesterday. We had over 40 phone calls yesterday, so that was, we were a bit overrun, but I'm catching up today. So we're always, we're always happy to discuss. And I can think brings us to any questions. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, Ian. Uh, I think the chat bar is open for any questions. So I think we've got one from Amy who's asked, if the safeguarding is in relation to the LPA, can we refer to advocacy? Well, I think I addressed it in there, but I'll just remind you, um, if the LPA, and we use the example of uh, property and finance LPA. So it used to be um, for IMCA, the answer would be no, because it, because the decision maker around financial decisions sit with the LPA. And there's, there's a reason for this, um, because when it comes to sort of the hierarchy of capacity, if the person had capacity to make the LPA, uh, make that decision to have an LPA and the safeguards that are built into that through the Office of the Public Guardian, the local authorities do not have the power to displace the LPA. The only person who has that power is the Court of Protection. So the answer is, so I suppose, twofold in that not an IMCA, because you, if there's an LPA in place and they, you think they're committing financial abuse and they are managing the finances, the MCA is very clear. There's an LPA in place. You can't have, a, have, an, have an IMCA. But under the under the Care Act, sorry, is someone trying to phone me up? I'm not sure what's happened to the uh, hand out. Sorry, sorry about that. It should have muted if I had my other devices set up. But then we go. Um, but under the Care Act, because the su support is about through a local authority led process, a Section 42 or 44 inquiry, it's not about who's the decision maker around the finances. It's about supporting the individual through the, the th local authority led process. So the, the, now the short answer, Amy, is yes, you can have advocacy, and that would be under the CARE Act. I so say this is one of the ways that the CARE Act solved some of the problems and lessons learned we had around IMCAs involved in safeguarding. Thanks, Ian. Um, if there's any more questions, I think we've got some time. Um, but if not, we can send you uh, Ian and Kelly's email for any questions around instructed and non-instructed advocacy. Um, the slides will be made available on our website um, and this session has been recorded, so it will be published publicly um, on our YouTube channel and we'll also put it out there on our website. Um, so it will be made available for, for all of you. Um, apologies for, for the slight technical issue that we had earlier. Um, we're happy that Ian was able to kind of come in and present um, because I think it's important that we illustrate the difference between instructed and non-instructed advocacy. Um, and as Sarah pointed out, you know, we have a number of referrals that are low in terms of advocacy. So um, we want to raise that awareness around the, the topic itself. Um, if there's any more questions or if you'd like to email us, uh, please contact the board. Uh, we'll, I think Sarah's just put in a a feedback form for, for, for you all to fill in. So it would be much appreciated if you could send any feedback um, around this topic in general or any other issues you have uh, in terms of safeguarding that you'd like us to raise. Um, we're open to any other topic discussions for, for the future. So uh, please feel free to get in touch. Uh, I think that's all. Uh, Sarah, if, you, if there's anything else that I've missed, um, I'm not sure if you want to come in or. No, just um, thank you. And if you can complete the feedback form, that's really welcome. Any challenges with the IT behind it, please let us know, because I know we've got people here from out of county, um, sorry, county council, and sometimes the IT doesn't support us, but we would really appreciate your feedback on this and also any ideas for other topics. So um, I put the board's website in the chat as well so you can all find us when we'll um, upload these but no nothing from me but thank you thank you to our speakers as well and Kelly if you could stay on I'd appreciate that thank you everybody thanks everyone thank you